A little while ago now, I made a video and an article about all of the great recent Greek mythology books that have been floating around. It's been a kind of renaissance for Greek mythology, where so many great contemporary authors are trying their hand at rewriting and playing around with these legendary myths, these iconic things that so many of us grow up with. And a lot of these writers are fantastic feminists who are shining a light on the women of these stories, the women who are so often overlooked. They are adjusting the scope. They are fleshing out these tales. They are doing a wonderful justice to these characters. And so, I talked about a whole bunch of them in an article and a video, and since then I've read a few more, so I have two more to talk about. The first is Stone Blind by Natalie Haynes. Now, Natalie Haynes wrote Thousand Ships and Pandora's Jar, both of which I really enjoyed, and I wrote a review of Thousand Ships for a different publication quite a while ago now. What surprised me about Thousand Ships that I didn't expect is the fact that it has so many different protagonists. It is a multi-perspective novel, and it tracks the story of the Trojan War from so many different angles, including those of gods, and it plays around with narrative structure, including a lot of things like epistolary elements, letters and diaries, etc. Stoneblind, I expected to be a more straightforward, solitary narrative, because this is the tale of Medusa. It's Medusa's story. She will tell it. And actually, that's not true. Once again, Natalie Haynes decides to have a multi-character perspective journey. There are maybe five or six different perspectives within this novel, and we flip between them pretty liberally. Of course, one of those is Medusa herself. We learn the story of how she was born, how she was abandoned, how she was raised by the Gorgons, her sisters, and we get her sister's perspectives as well. And what we also get, which is a whole heap of fun, is the perspective of Perseus, the man who ultimately kills Medusa by cutting off her head. This is a legendary thing within Greek mythology. If you know, if you grew up with, if you've watched films or played video games or read books about Greek mythology, you know that Perseus cuts off Medusa's head. And you also know that Medusa is a monster with snakes for hair whose very gaze turns you to stone. That's her thing. She's a beast. She's a monster. And right at the beginning of this novel, there is a short prologue that describes the concept of monster. And actually, I think I'm gonna read it out because it really lays the groundwork for the thematic and political and personal and social thesis of this novel, which is intensely, aggressively feminist. I see you. I see all those whom men call monsters. And I see the men who call them that, call themselves heroes, of course. I only see them for an instant and then they're gone, but it's enough. Enough to know that the hero isn't the one who's kind, or brave, or loyal. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes, he is monstrous. And the monster, who is she? She is what happens when someone cannot be saved. This particular monster is assaulted, abused, and vilified. And yet, as the story is always told, she is the one you should fear. She is the monster. We'll see about that. That's the first page of this book. And from here, as I said, we get multiple perspectives on the lead up from Medusa's birth to her death and beyond. We see the way that Athena curses Medusa purely out of a sense of spite and jealousy. And the way that a single wave of a hand from an immortal god that means so little to her, if anything at all, ruins the life of a mortal who has already been deemed an outcast and a monster, and now she is cursed. Now she will be even lonelier than she previously was. And all the while, her sisters, the other Gorgons, raise her, treat her with love and respect, warn her about the outside world. Now, this is not a new concept, the idea that monsters are in fact not monsters at all, and mortal men are the real monsters. It's a story we've seen before in several mediums, but it's still done here with power behind it. It has teeth and claws. It is 
as I said, aggressively feminist. And I love it for that. Thousand Ships was a powerful novel. This is more intimate. Although, as I said, it still follows many different perspectives, it is still more intimate because it is focusing on the lives of these people, the way that they grow, the way that they change. Perseus is framed as a pathetic creature. He's an idiot boy who was born of a woman who was taken advantage of by Zeus, as so many people were, especially women. But then Perseus is given a task, and that task is to kill a Gorgon. And he barely knows what a Gorgon is. He doesn't care. A thing is a monster, a monster is a thing that should die, and so off he goes. He's about 20 years old, he's given a sword, and off he fucks. And it's the arrogance of men. Arrogance and ignorance paired together to create a spoiled young man with no context for anything, who has an oversized ego that he doesn't deserve and hasn't earned. And then on the other side you have Medusa, cursed, outcast, destined, more or less, to struggle and have a difficult life. But the story takes a lot of twists and turns, and I'm making it seem like a dismally depressing and dark tale. And it is, absolutely, that's how Haynes writes it. But it remains an exciting read, because it is full of these huge swathes of emotional waters that churn up all the way through the narrative. That was a really messy metaphor. I didn't write that down, I just said it. I kind of regret it. It's in there now. What did I even say? Swathes of water and... Ah, oh, it's dreadful, Well, you can do better. Anywho. Anywho what? What was I saying? Oh yeah, this novel's an emotional roller coaster in a fun way. Because you've got gods versus mortals, you've got betrayal, you've got monsters with magical powers turning people to stone. It's exciting in terms of its events. It's very depressing and difficult in terms of the way that it frames and highlights patriarchal power over women, and women often being monsters. Again, so often in Greek mythology, women are monsters and monsters are women. It kind of reminds me of the thing in James Bond films where the villain always has to be physically deformed in some way, whether minor or major. People with deformities are villains. People who are disabled are villains. Queer people are villains. Villains are often queer-coded, and women are often monsters. This book really highlights that injustice. But because it is a book about Greek mythology, it remains an awful lot of fun in terms of the events, in terms of the swinging swords and magic powers and gods doing ridiculous things. It's a book that'll make you angry, but in a kind of fun way. And then we have Electra. Electra is the second novel by Jennifer Saint. Her first novel was Ariadne, which I really enjoyed. Ariadne was a novel Again, about the mistreatment of women, and about reframing heroes in Greek mythology as abusive, underhanded, and spiteful men, who are not half as clever as they think they are, and so often they think they're clever because they could get away with anything. The bar is low for them, and it's much higher for women, and for monsters. And I really enjoyed Ariadne, especially because it had my favourite god in it, the wonderfully sexy Dionysus. And Dionysus plays a really large role in Ariadne. This is pretty much godless. This is mostly about mortals. And one thing that disappointed me initially about this book, which I should have seen coming based on the blurb, but I didn't give it much thought, is that it's another book about the Trojan War. So many of these Greek mythology retellings, most of which I really enjoy, are set during and around the Trojan War. Again and again and again. So as soon as I saw the names Agamemnon, Odysseus, Helen, Achilles, Paris, I thought, okay, here we go again. And yes, the Trojan War plays a large role in this, but it's very much about everything surrounding it rather than being within it. If you read The Song of Achilles, you are in the Trojan War. If you read the aforementioned Thousand Ships, you are in the Trojan War. But this takes an approach to the Trojan War that is similar to Pat Barker's The Silence of the Girls, which is probably my favourite of all of these Greek mythology retelling books, because Pat Barker has heart and soul that outmatches anyone else, in my opinion. But this comes pretty close. Electra is a three-narrative story about the titular Electra, who was the youngest daughter of King Agamemnon. But one of the other characters in this, which is arguably the hero of the story, 
I guess she's kind of the one that's easiest to root for and support and sympathize with and feel sorry for, is Electra's mother, Agamemnon's wife, Clytemnestra. I don't know if I'm saying that right. I've never heard her name said out loud before. I've never heard her mentioned in any books or films or anything that I've encountered related to Greek mythology, which says a lot. Electra and Clytemnestra are overlooked, as is the third character, Cassandra, who is a princess of Troy and has been cursed by Apollo to be able to see the future, but no one ever believes her. That's the crux of her character. And I will say, without spoiling anything, Cassandra's story doesn't really amount to enough for me. It feels like she was thrown in and she's given some chapters and she's given a kind of arc, but her arc doesn't end in a satisfying way for me. I was kind of let down by the way that she was stitched into this narrative. Because really, the focus is on the mother and daughter, Clytemnestra and Electra. It's really their story. And Cassandra is there to offer a few other perspectives from a different place and time, and to feel sorry for, but it doesn't amount to enough. Clytemnestra's story is really something. <laughs> it's, it's really difficult to read. There were things that happened to her that made me very, very close to tears. I don't often cry at novels, although I recently bawled my eyes out reading Edward Carey's Little, oh my god. But I was close to crying as I read a lot of the moments that Clytemnestra has to suffer through. And Electra is a fascinating character. She reminded me of the non-fiction book Bad Gaze, because Electra's not a good character, and so many novels and non-fiction books frame women and queer people as downtrodden, good people. We are good. We are under the thumb of patriarchy. We suffer. You should pity us. And yeah, there's truth to all of that, but there are plenty of women and plenty of queer people who are awful, terrible people. And so it's nice to see a feminist retelling of a piece of Greek mythology like this that frames its titular character as naive, arrogant, and kind of stupid. Electra, as the story goes, becomes a very dangerous, unlikable, and stupid person. I find that a very useful narrative to have, because a feminist retelling should also frame the women of the story as bad people as much as it does good people. We should be adding dimension to the women who were not given dimension in the original Greek tales, and that's what Jennifer Saint does here. She dares to make her titular character an asshole, and I really applaud her for that. There's satisfaction in framing the women of Greek mythology as good and looking at them as tragic heroes, yes, but it's also really fun to see them be pricks, and that's what you get here with Electra. While also feeling desperately sorry for Clytemnestra, the wife of Agamemnon, a man who everybody knows if they've ever encountered any Greek mythology. So you get your sympathetic heroine and you get your bellend. <laughs> And I'm so happy that Jennifer Saint did both here with this novel. I'm really grateful for her approach. So there you go. There are two really good, pretty heavy, hardback books that I held up for too long for no real reason. I know that this trend of Greek mythology retellings is everywhere at the moment, and while I am now fully bored of the Trojan War, I still appreciate them, and I still read them when they come out. I haven't read Ithaca by Claire North yet, and I really want to. And Jennifer Saint's next book, Atalanta, I can't wait to get a hold of. It's coming out in April. I'll be reading it. Because I love mythology, and I will keep reading these books. Yes, there are perhaps too many, but as long as they're good, keep them coming. And subscribe for books.